It's compact, from the early 90s, and it's an absolute classic. Hello all and welcome back to the corner. Today I have this rather classic computer in. The Apple Mac Classic 2 was the obvious successor to the Mac Classic, itself a continuation of the small all-in-one factor design that debuted with the original Macintosh. This is a form factor that Apple didn't let die up until 1995 with the discontinuation of the Apple Color Classic. That machine however came in a very different style of case, more resembling the LC500 or Performer 500 style of cases. Classic still retains a characteristic industrial design with a more modern curved front and snow white plastic colour. It also retains the same 9 inch monochrome display with a resolution of 512 by 342. The Mac Classic 2 is part of the 68K family of Macs, running an O30 CPU at 16MHz. Despite sharing the same CPU and running at the same clock speed as its predecessor, the Mac SE30, the Classic only has roughly 60% of the performance due to Apple reducing the data bit path down to 16 bits and limiting the maximum amount of RAM to 10MB. Typical. Looking at the unit, we can see not much more than the 9 inch monitor and the 800K auto inject floppy drive. As with a lot of Apple's products, form and presentation was key. And I do like it, it's a nice change from the cluttered beige boxes of PCs, if not as expandable. But as with most computers, if expansions is what you needed, you didn't buy a computer that you couldn't expand. Looking at the back, we have the mains AC input and a big clunking power switch, speaker output, modem and printer RS422 serial ports, external 25 pin SCSI for devices like hard drives, scanners and CD-ROM drives, an external floppy port for one extra drive, one ADB port for devices like keyboards, mice, tablets and light pens, and finally a microphone input. The Classic doesn't have an internal microphone, so if you like recording your voice, like me, you need to provide one. This cover here hides the PRAM bat uh, monitor controls, which can be adjusted if your screen isn't perfect. Speaking of which, let's power this on and see what happens. Well, we have the chimes of life. Oh. Oh no. If you ever see your Mac do this, turn it off. That bright line will burn the screen if left on for a long period of time and it will be irreversible, needing replacement of the CRT screen. So, we'll need to open this unit and investigate. There's four screws on these classic Mac designs. They're Torx T20 and they're a pain to remove the top ones. Thankfully, someone has been kind enough to lose those top screws for me, so I don't need to bother removing them. So I only need to remove the easier bottom ones. I'm putting a towel down to avoid scratching the table up. This is real printed wood paper and I don't want to leave any scratch marks on it. The back removes simply by lifting the casing up, carefully. Now we must avoid touching the CRT or its driving board in case there's any built up charge from either the screen, flyback or power supply capacitors. CRT monitors can quite often run at thousands of volts and I don't fancy touching that. I'll unplug the hard drive, a 40 megabyte quantum SCSI drive. Copy drive cable, and the motherboard combined video and power connector before carefully sliding the motherboard out and out of the cage. I'm going to have to remove the analog board which drives the CRT to work on it. To do that I will have to discharge the CRT. I will show you how to do this, but if you don't understand what to do or otherwise unsure and need to do this, please consult a qualified professional to help you. To discharge the screen, I will be using this screwdriver with an ample cable on it. I don't need this thick of wire, but it had a ring terminal already crimped onto the end of it, which allows me to screw it into the CRT corner where the DAG ground connects to. Once screwed in, I can use that flat tip to undo the CRT flyback clip. It didn't spark, so the discharge resistors had already done their work before me.
but with the cup now removed I can remove the analog board. I also need to remove the CRT neck board, which whilst was originally glued on, it's since long dried out and gone hard so I can easily pull it off now. I would recommend you remove the neck board if you're going to do any major work on the Plastic Max, such as removing the floppy drives or the hard drive, as the neck of the screen is very easy to break and removing this board just takes some of that chance away. The connector is keyed anyway, so it will only go back on one way anyway. Next I'll unscrew the DAG ground cable, unplug the yoke connector, and then remove the single posi head screw that holds the analog board to the cage. Watch out for the hard drive and fan power connectors however. Here's a close up of the Classic 2's motherboard. It is tiny! Up here we have the 30 pin SIM RAM slots upgradable to 10 megabyte, the integrated 2 megabyte of RAM, audio code chip, RS422 serial chips, VSLI chip for handling the system bus, AMD SCSI controller, 512 kilobytes of ROM containing the system BIOS, system tools and even a little hidden gem. Then we have the Motorola 68030 CPU running at 16MHz but with that 16-bit data path. Below is a small microcontroller that runs the ADB port. This 50 pin connector to the side was supposed to be used for floating point units or ROM upgrades but Apple never officially released anything for it. I can only find information to say that there was one FBU made for this machine in either synchronous or asynchronous speeds, otherwise it seems to have gone unused. This is the swim chip or super was integrated machine which is responsible for controlling the floppy drives. Here's the analog board out of the Classic 2. Classic Macs are among the computers of the time known to fail with capacitors going bad and even though I doubt the capacitors will fix vertical collapse on the CRT, it may as well be done anyway. So for this I've went and bought a bag full of Panasonic capacitors to replace the originals on the PCB with. Even though you can use higher voltage rated capacitors, I just wanted to keep it all the same. Now one thing that we've got a problem of is that most of these capacitors are entirely different values so I could take them all off but I'm going to have a fun time trying to figure out which way or which ones go back where and it's not like you can just take a picture of the PCB and know because all the cap values are on the side and because they're radial um, some are here, some are there, some are there, some are there, you just can't win. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this one at a time, it'll probably take me a bit longer but at least I'll be certain I've got the exact um, capacitor in the right place. So I think I'm going to start on this one first, just because it's bent. And whilst he does that, I'm going to get the funk out. You'll see these markings on the board which indicates a positive leg of the capacitor. The stripe down the side of the capacitor is the negative side, so in this case the positive side is the non-striped side. Just make sure you pay attention to this and which capacitor the mark is for, as even I slipped up with this on this job.
that's all of them. We have all brand new and 90% Nitchi no, Panasonic capacitors. And uh, I just noticed that this has says it's Corona okay. So there's only one thing for that. And now the favorite part. completely missed that. That's why we don't turn the soldering iron off. Let's take a good inspection, make sure everything is soldered, nothing is bridged that shouldn't be. That one. There, it's a bit suspect to me, just because it's close but it's not touching. If you spot any problems, please let me know, although it might be a little bit of time before I uh, see. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to reflow this now. I shouldn't need to, but the reason I'm going to do it is because I have worked on some of the monitor PCBs and these tend to crack. So I'm going to do that once I have a chance, that way I can be sure it's not going to be cracked when I power up. Even though the CRT was it's working, one less issue to deal with. But I'm not going to do that one because that's just a grounding pin. And when I say grounding pin, I quite literally mean it's a giant pin. So there's no point doing that one. And uh, you might also be wondering why I didn't change this, it's because these big ones, they, I've never seen them fail. I've not seen them leak, it's not to say that one hasn't leaked, but I don't think we'll need to worry about that. Another thing I'm going to check is behind here, is the CRT neck connector. Make sure that that isn't, yeah, I'm just going to reflow with that. That way I don't have to worry whether or not that's gonna crack on me. And it's nothing more than just applying a bit of solder to the terminals. Sure it probably didn't need doing, but it makes me feel better to have done it. Right, there we go. Put that clip back in because I would like to not uh I'd like to keep myself on high voltage and then we're done at least for this one right let's go see what happens let's stand out of the way in case it starts to blow up Looks like I'm going to have to go away and go look at the schematics to see what I can do to fix the screen. In the meanwhile, here are some of my other videos that you may enjoy. If you like what you see, please leave a thumbs up and subscribe for future videos. See you soon!